I now can sing since I've been redeemed. I'm on the everlasting, the everlasting rock. I faith in Christ, my Redeemer King. I'm on the everlasting, the everlasting rock. This is the voice of hope. Then roll, roll, billows roll. I'm on the everlasting rock of ages. Roll, roll, roll billows roll. Welcome, my friend, to a journey into the Bible. You're listening to the Voice of Hope, a clear message in the noise of life. Whether you're well versed in the Bible or just turning the pages for the first time, we're here with you, learning to follow Jesus, the only hope of salvation, one step at a time. I'm Anthony High, and I'm here with our Bible teacher, J. Mark Horst. The Voice of Hope is brought to you by Heralds of Hope where we use media to make disciples of Jesus Christ to accomplish the Great Commission in our lifetime. While our program currently airs on 31 stations in the U.S. and Canada, we have a significant international audience in English and in 25 additional languages. The responses from our listeners among the Hausa people in northern Nigeria nearly overwhelm our broadcasting partners. In the previous six months, There have been over 42,000 responses to our twice-weekly program. That's over 800 responses per episode. One man wrote, As a young man, I'm happy to be getting your programs. The Lord is speaking to me through this program. I praise God that he is using this unique opportunity to speak to so many people in this part of the world. On our earlier episode, J. Mark began a study in Mark chapter 5, verses 1 to 20, about Jesus' trip to the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. Listen as he reads these verses. Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains. And the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could any one tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, What is your name? 
And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine, that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about two thousand, and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So those who fed the swine fled, and they told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that had happened. Then they came to Jesus, and they saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion, sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine. Then they began to plead with him to depart out of their region. And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him, and all marveled. In that episode, we were introduced to several steps we must be willing to take to cross to the dark side. The first step is crossing barriers. While this seems obvious, it can be very difficult. J. Mark went on to point out that the gospel is for all people, especially those on the other side. The disciples were likely uncomfortable with this trip, and rightly so. It almost ended in disaster due to a storm that came up while they were crossing the lake. Upon arriving in the Gadarenes, the disciples were faced with the second step, confronting evil. Jesus and his disciples were immediately confronted by a demon-possessed man who could not be controlled by any human means. This is where J. Mark ended his teaching last week because we were out of time. So here he is now to continue our study in Mark chapter 5. Now even though demons are spirit beings, it seems they're uncomfortable with being disembodied. Why else would they ask Jesus for permission to go into the pigs? This request also tells me that Satan and his demons are not omniscient. That is, they don't know everything. Would they have kept begging Jesus to send them into the pigs if they had known that those pigs would all drown in the sea? I don't think so, because they ended up without a body to host them. At the insistence of the demons, Jesus permitted them. By his power, Jesus could have sent them anywhere, even back to the abyss. The fact that he didn't do that tells us he had a larger purpose to fulfill in his interactions with both the demons and the residents of Gadara. John MacArthur wrote, and I'm quoting him, By granting permission for these demons to go into the herd of pigs, Jesus was allowing them to put on display the true magnitude of their destructive and deadly force. In so doing, he also highlighted the glorious superiority of his own power. And that's the end of the quote. Now, what happened next must have stunned the bystanders. That entire herd of 2,000 pigs went berserk and stampeded down a steep slope and into the Sea of Galilee to their death. This was undeniable proof that the demons had left the man and had entered into the pigs. It also illustrated the damaging power of the demons on a massive scale. More importantly, it demonstrated Jesus' absolute authority over them. They had no choice but to comply with his sovereign command. We have many warnings in Scripture that evil will increase as we approach the end of the age. Jesus and the apostles spoke about how evil behaviors will come out of the closet and into the mainstream of culture as Satan realizes that his time for deception is growing short. And I've witnessed this happening in my short lifetime. For those who follow Christ, 
confronting evil in society today is much more costly than it was in the past. But we must not shrink back in fear. Instead, we need to put on the full armor of God so we can stand against the schemes of the devil. We are not struggling against human beings, but against spiritual forces of evil in this world of darkness that work through human beings. We must not retreat in the face of opposition, but go boldly forward to confront evil in our time. Going to the dark side requires us to cross barriers and confront evil. Another step in going to the dark side is choosing sides. Not all demonstrations of Jesus' power are as dramatic as this one. But one thing is sure. When Jesus shows up, you can't be neutral. You can either accept him or reject him, but you can't ignore him. The people who cared for the pigs and witnessed their dramatic destruction didn't wait around to see what would happen next. They took to their heels in fear, and as they went, they told everyone they saw about what had happened to that herd of pigs. Now, the text isn't clear about whether they had seen the transformation in the former demoniac, but the news spread like wildfire across the whole region, and when people heard about what had happened, they wanted to see it with their own eyes. So they came to see if what they had been told was true, and sure enough, the pigs were there, floating in the water. But even more astounding was the man who had been possessed by many demons sitting there with Jesus. He was fully dressed, and his mind was completely restored. He and Jesus were conversing together, and the people were afraid. They had the same kind of fear that the disciples experienced after Jesus stilled the storm on the Sea of Galilee. It was the realization that they were in the presence of the Holy One. Now, imagine those who had witnessed these dramatic events retelling them to the curious crowd that had gathered. I can see them imitating the behavior of the demoniac and maybe the calm composure of Jesus and the violent reaction of the pigs. I can picture them pointing to the bodies of all those dead pigs floating in the water. It was almost more than one could wrap their mind around. And the response? The people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. Why? Was it the loss of the 2,000 pigs? Possibly. This would have been a major shock to the local economy. I think the pigs could have still been butchered and the meat used, but that may have glutted the market and caused the price to fall, at least temporarily. Were these people content to remain in the kingdom of darkness to protect their possessions and the things that were familiar to them? Were they more concerned about their livelihood than the deliverance of this tormented man? Or were they bothered by the fact that they had witnessed a demonstration of power that left them feeling very uncomfortable? Remember what I said earlier? When Jesus shows up, you can't be neutral. You can either accept him or reject him, but you cannot ignore him. Jesus warned his followers it would be this way. In Luke 12, 51 to 53, Jesus said, Do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. For from now on, five in one house will be divided, three against two and two against three. Father will be divided against son and son against father mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, Mother mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. These people decided they didn't want Jesus in their community. And you know something? You can make that same choice today. You have that freedom. But you cannot choose the consequences of your choice. They are built into your decision. Just like the people of Gadara, The behavior of most unbelievers today isn't as extreme as the demoniac. But regardless of their behavior, every human being is a sinner. I suppose there were lots of good people in that community. People who took pride in their culture, their heritage, or maybe their citizenship. But when they rejected Jesus, they chose the temporary over the eternal. 
Jesus wanted to give them freedom from sin, just like he had given to the demoniac. Going to the dark side requires us to cross barriers and confront evil. It also requires us to choose sides. Today, you have the opportunity to choose. Which side will you choose? And then the final step in going to the dark side is commissioning witnesses. In response to the request of the crowd there on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, Jesus prepares to leave the area. As he's getting into the boat, the formerly demon-possessed man keeps begging him, Let me go with you. Let me go with you. We can surely sympathize with his desire, can't we? Jesus had delivered him from a life of misery and degradation. Gone was the constant torment of a deranged mind and the pain of his mutilated body. In many ways, his existence was worse than that of an animal. And so out of gratitude, he was ready to follow Jesus anywhere and everywhere. But Jesus denied this man's pleading. Instead, he said to him, Go to your home, to your own people, and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and that he has had mercy on you. Maybe that seems harsh to us. Shouldn't he have had the opportunity to be with Jesus for a while so he could grow in his faith and understanding? How was he going to survive as the only believer in this pagan community? I take comfort in the fact that Jesus knows everything. He knew this man, and he knew how he would respond to Jesus' command. And so Jesus gave him the hardest assignment possible. Go home to your family and friends and be my witness there. That was his commission. So the man went off as Jesus commanded. He shared his story throughout that whole region of Decapolis, telling anyone and everyone who would listen all that Jesus had done for him. And what happened after that? We don't know. That's the end of the story for us. But I can assure you of at least two things. First, this promise was given by God to the prophet Isaiah. For as the rain comes down, and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void or empty, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Everyone who heard this man's story was amazed, and I am confident that some of them were transformed too. Second, we can also be assured that as this man recounted the story of his miraculous deliverance over and over and over again, his love for Jesus and his gratefulness for his mercy grew deeper and deeper. Remember Jesus said, To whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. And the reverse is just as true. The one who is forgiven much the same loves much. The challenge that many of us face today is to realize just how much we've been forgiven. We have the tendency, like the crowds there on the seashore that day, to compare ourselves to others whom we consider the worst of sinners. We're not nearly as bad as the demoniac. We see our behavior as respectable, and we don't engage in many of the sinful practices that are so prevalent all around us. But when you and I open our hearts before the holy presence of Jesus, we gain a deeper understanding of our own depravity. Our pride, our self-righteousness, our refusal to forgive others, our bitterness toward those who have wronged us, our insistence on our rights, and a whole host of other things show us just how much we need the mercy and the grace of Jesus. In reality, Jesus came over to the dark side to save you and to save me, too. You will recall that some of Jesus' final instructions to the disciples just before his ascension to heaven were, But you shall receive power, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Jesus' command to them 
was similar to the command he gave the former demoniac. Your witness begins at home. And Jesus has given you and me that same commission. Maybe you think your story isn't dramatic or compelling. Well, not many people have a story like the demoniac. But every born-again child of God has a redemption story to tell. You and I can testify of the peace we have in our hearts, knowing that our sins are forgiven. We can tell others how God has given us a purpose for living that goes beyond ourselves and beyond our time here on earth. We can also share with them how God has given us victory over habits that are harmful to our bodies and to our relationships with other people, and the list goes on. In all of this, we need to assure them that these things are true, not because we're good people, but because Jesus has set us free from the power of sin. Going to the dark side isn't easy and it isn't comfortable, but Jesus hasn't called us to an easy and a comfortable life. He's called us to cross the barriers, to go places we really don't want to go. He has given us the power through his Holy Spirit to confront evil and to call people to choose which side they will be on. And he has commissioned us as his witnesses, first at home and then into the wider world. All the while, you and I must remember that Jesus left the glorious light and glory of heaven to come over to the dark side to rescue us. May God give us courage to follow his example. We're across the crowded ways of life Where sound the cries of race and clan Above the noise of selfish Thank you, J. Mark. This concludes our study in Mark chapter 5, verses 1 to 20. What stood out to me in this study is how Jesus went through these steps to bring salvation to me, and then his clear call to follow him to take the good news to the dark side. Thank you for joining us today on The Voice of Hope. If you would like to listen to this program again, please visit our website, www. Dot heraldsofhope.org and look for the title Going to the Dark Side or you may contact us to get a CD, paper, or digital copy. We would love to hear from you. If you would like to send a gift or a note, you may do so through our website www.heraldsofhope.org or by email at hope at heraldsofhope.org That's H-O-P-E at heraldsofhope.org. Our phone number is 
960-0292. If you prefer to send a letter or gift by mail, our address is The Voice of Hope, P.O. Box 3, Breezewood, Pennsylvania, 15533. We also have a phone call-in number where you can listen to the three latest programs right from your phone. The number for the call-in program is 717-790-5503. Again, that's 717-790-5503. I invite you to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, or Spotify by searching for Heralds of Hope. Your prayers are needful, and your financial gifts are always welcome. You can learn more about Heralds of Hope and how we can be your channel to share the Word of God to a place you can't visit and in a language you don't speak by visiting our website at heraldsofhope.org. God's grace, accompanied by your fervent prayers and generous financial support, will enable the voice of hope to be on the air until Jesus comes in the air. Be sure to join us next time for J. Mark's teaching on Mark chapter 5, verses 21 to 43. Don't be afraid, just believe. Be not dismayed,